Senator Dirksen, Mr. Chief Justice, Mr. Vice President, President Johnson, Vice President Humphrey, my fellow Americans, and my fellow citizens of the world community. I ask you to share with me today the majesty of this moment. In the orderly transfer of power, we celebrate the unity that keeps us free. Each moment in history is a fleeting time, precious and unique. But some stand out as moments of beginning, in which courses are set that shape decades or centuries. This can be such a moment. Forces now are converging that make possible for the first time the hope that many of man's deepest aspirations can at last be realized. The spiraling pace of change allows us to contemplate within our own lifetime advances that once would have taken centuries. In throwing wide the horizons of space, we have discovered new horizons on Earth. For the first time, because the people of the world want peace, and the leaders of the world are afraid of war. The times are on the side of peace. Eight years from now, America will celebrate its 200th anniversary as a nation. And within the lifetime of most people now living, mankind will celebrate that great new year which comes only once in a thousand years, the beginning of the third millennium. What kind of a nation we will be, what kind of a world we will live in, whether we shape the future in the image of our hopes is ours is to determine by our actions and our choices. The greatest honor history can bestow is the title of peacemaker. This honor now beckons America. The chance to help lead the world at last out of the valley of turmoil and on to that high ground of peace that man has dreamed of since the dawn of civilization. If we succeed, generations to come will say of us now living that we mastered our moment, that we helped make the world safe for mankind. This is our summons to greatness. And I believe the American people are ready to answer this call. The second third of this century has been a time of proud achievement. We have made enormous strides in science and industry and agriculture. We have shared our wealth more broadly than ever. We've learned at last to manage a modern economy to assure its continued growth. We have given freedom new reach. We have begun to make its promise real for black as well as for white. We see the hope of tomorrow in the youth of today. I know America's youth. I believe in them. We can be proud that they are better educated, more committed, more passionately driven by conscience than any generation in our history. No people has ever been so close to the achievement of a just and abundant society or so possessed of the will to achieve it. And because our strengths are so great, we can afford to appraise our weaknesses with candor and to approach them with hope. Standing in this same place a third of a century ago, Franklin Delano Roosevelt addressed the nation ravaged by depression, gripped in fear. He could say, in surveying the nation's troubles, they concern, thank God, only material things. Our crisis today is in reverse. We find ourselves rich in goods, but ragged in spirit, reaching with magnificent precision for the moon, but falling into raucous discord on earth. We are caught in war wanting peace. We're torn by division wanting unity. We see around us empty lives wanting fulfillment. We see tasks that need doing, waiting for hands to do them. To 
a crisis of the spirit, we need an answer of the spirit. And to find that answer, we need only look within ourselves. When we listen to the better angels of our nature, we find that they celebrate the simple things, the basic things such as goodness, decency, love, kindness, 